present the last chapter of this um, part two of the book uh, with the title Interactive Application Security Testing. Um, so my name is Ramon Barakat. Uh, together with my colleague Martin Schneider and others, we are working on this topic since a few years now in different projects, and we are focusing mainly on hybrid fuzzing. Um, so because we have a fuzzing background, let's say, so um, working on fuzzing topics in since some years now. Um, and yeah, so we are from Fraunhofer Focus, which is a research institute uh, in Germany, and it's located in Berlin. And um, when I just dive into the topic um, today in this presentation, I will just give you a really short overview about the chapter. Um, so what are the topics in this chapter? And for sure, I will not go that deep into this um, technical stuff. So for this, you can check out the book and um, when you are interested, go somehow deeper into the topic. Um, today it will just be an overview um, what we are presenting or what we described in this chapter. So uh, we will first come to the tool support for security testing, which are available today. And then I will give you one example um, how interactive testing can look like um, when we go to the verification of static analyze findings. And um, at the end, I will give you also a short overview about the research questions we ask ourselves in order to prepare this book chapter. So um, when we're talking about security testing, um, so traditionally we have two, um, yeah, two testing methodologies. We have on the one hand, we have static analyzers, and on the other hand, we have dynamic analyzers. Um, both have different advantages and uh, disadvantages. For example, the static analyzers um, has the possibility to really analyze the whole code. So we have a high pass coverage. We have a really good presentation of findings because we can really point the user or the developer um, to the code location where um, some vulnerabilities or suspected vulnerabilities uh, could be. But we also have the drawback since we can, or in most cases, the systems are so complex that we cannot um, analyze everything. So some abstraction is needed. And because of this exception, we or static analyzers also produce a number of false positives. So on the other hand, we have dynamic analyzers. There we have um, the advantage that we have a few, pos a few false positives because we really execute the code. And when we detect something, then it is in the code. So and it, it, um, the bug could be triggered because we already did so. Um, and we can also provide the input that leads to this vulnerability um, so that the user can um, check if this input is relevant, can um, also execute the code and um, yeah, do some debugging and bug fixing. Um, what is the big disadvantage for sure? We have uh, in the most cases one and pass coverage, so we are mostly not able to cover everything. And we have also sometimes a poor uh, result presentation because um, sometimes the system is just crashing in the in the worst case it's just crashing without giving any information then it's um, quite hard to um, find the location in the code which leads to this system crash um, and now um, the idea in the last few years the idea is coming up to combine both techniques uh, and this is in the term of interactive uh, analyzers or interactive security testing, which means we use both um, testing methodologies in order to support each other. And um, so what we are shown here in the slide is that the static analyzers, um, let me just uh, use a laser pointer here. So um, this icon represents this static analyzer, so the code can be analyzed and provide some information that is uh, giving to the dynamic LL analyzers, for example. And um, here in red, you see that some input, some bytes needs to have a certain value in order to trigger something, and then we can produce a crash there. And the dynamic analyzers can also report information to static analyzers, so information that just occurs on runtime and that cannot be um, gathered by just analyzing the source code. And this can provide it by the dynamic analyzers um, giving to the static analyzers in order to improve the analyzers itself. 
so here we have more or less the advantages of both uh, of both words let's say um we have the high pass coverage thanks to static analyzers we have good presentation of the results we can provide the input data because yeah as as can be seen here the input data um, is already there that leads to the vulnerability and we can also reduce the number of false positives um because we can also um check if uh, input really leads to vulnerability or not. So um, yeah, this both tools uh, can be used uh, interactively, as I said, so um, sorry, the animation was not completed. Yeah, so um, as I already presented on the previous slide, so the static analysis can produce some findings or some results, some informations giving to the dynamic analyzers dynamic analysis can execute it and also provide um, analysis to um, resource to static analyzers and then uh, it could be an um, such an circle or iter iterative approach that they can um, the, the dynamic analysis can um, in order support the static analyzers to improve themselves they can uh, generate more results that can again um, be used by dynamic analy analysis and so on. So it can be an iterative improvement of both. And um, since this is a circle, uh, it's also not, or it don't need to be defined what is the, what is the starting point. So um, I have uh, explained in a previous um, slide that the static analysis is starting point, but it could also be the case that we start with the dynamic analysis. So let's say we start with a testing campaign and then at a certain point we give the information that we already have to a static analyzers in order to um, start the analyzers there and then yeah, run this circle again. Um, it could also look like this on the right hand side so that we run both analyzers in parallel and then in certain uh, points we just um, in the, so the uh, analyzers both uh, interact with each other so they exchange the information during runtime so that uh, the one analyst don't need to wait for the other one so um yeah as i said they can run a parallel uh, parallel and then if a research is available um they can exchange it with with each other so um when i just give you a concrete example um how it can look like so um as i already said the static analysis produces a number of findings. Um, after the analysis is finished, we don't have 100%. Uh, we are not 100% sure if the findings are really vulnerabilities, so are the true positives, or maybe they are false positives. Um, we sort it by the abstraction of the analysis. So um, the dynamic analysis can be used as such a filter, let's say, um, in order to divide the number of findings and the true positives and false positives. So um, what we did uh, technically, so I would just give you um, a small overview here. Um, what we did, so we used the source code and the set analysis findings and give them to a so-called constraint solver. Um, so that collects all the constraints during the execution pass or doing the, um, yeah, all the passes through the code. And then we try to solve this um, I was too fast. So yeah, um, we uh, run the constraint solving and then when there is no solution, so this means that there is no possibility that we can generate a test input that leads to this vulnerability, then we can declare this as a false positive um, because then yeah, there's no possibility to trigger this vulnerability. Um, but if there is a solution, then we generate a test code for it. So um, in our example, um, we had uh, we are working on C applications, so this was a C test code that um, generated here, and we also instrument the source code so that we can observe if a vulnerability is really triggered, and also collect some more information that we then later on can give to the static analyzers, um, as I presented in the previous slide. Uh, yeah, and then for sure we need to execute the code, uh, the test code, and when the system crash or the vulnerability could be observed, then we can declare this as a true positive. But for sure, it could also be the case that we execute the code uh, or the test case and there is then, oh, sorry, so that 
there is then no crash, so we cannot observe the vulnerability. And now um, we can declare this as a false positive again. Um, when I'm saying this, this is, I have to be honest, it's not true because just when we execute the test case and we cannot observe the vulnerability, it did, doesn't mean that this is really a false positive. It could be that the test case was not correct. Maybe the data was not correct. Maybe a certain configuration um, needs to be set it to, in order to trigger this vulnerability. So um, yeah, we have to put a question mark here because we cannot um, really state this as a false positive. And this leads us to the um, challenge that um, for sure we cannot easily filter or um, specify the findings in true positive and false positive. We also have a certain set of findings, and to be honest, they are um, not not small. Um, uh, so many of the findings, we don't have the real classification if they're a true positive or a false positive. Um, and yeah, I think most of you already knows the, the words from Dijkstra that testing can be used for showing the presence of bugs. So this is the set here where we have the true positive, but they can never show their absence. Um, so what we need here is we need somehow also a measurement for this um, finding that we cannot 100% classify into uh, true or false positives. Um, and for this, an uh, we see the risk estimation is needed so that we have a clue which of these findings we need to analyze um, yeah, a little bit more or which of them are um, not that okay, not not that critical is not the, the correct term, but um, which of them are maybe um, um, I have a lower priority um, to analyze uh, to be analyzed. And so that is where um, and to be honest, not we, but um, uh, go through, uh, yeah, Aaron Good and uh, Turing are coming up with a good Turing estimator. Uh, this is a mathematical um, estimator which can be used in order to measure the um, the probability of a so-called missing mass. Um, when you're interested in the mathematics uh, behind this, you can um, check the chapter, um, the book chapter, um, but here just in, uh, in yeah, to, to, have, uh, to make it short, um, traditional estimator, they just give you an assumption of the elements that they already have um, observed so when you um yeah ob observed uh when you have on with some boards and you observe the red ones and blue ones then you have just an estimation that maybe 20 percent are red and um yeah eight percent are blue uh, boards in it but you have no idea that there are maybe also black ones white ones green ones so you can just have a prediction for the elements you already have seen and um the Guturing estimator um, tries to change this estimation, so they also give you uh, a prediction of unseen elements. So, um, what is the is the probability that you will discover something that you didn't uh, discover before? And um, so, and uh, Marcel Böhmer, uh, which is also a um, researcher, was deeply working with uh, in the field of fuzzing. He used this estimator in a uh, field of gray box fuzzing and shows that um, with this estimator, you can give a residual risk estimation um, for, yeah, in, in this case, um, uh, how, how the prop, um, yeah, which is the level of probability that you will discover more vulnerabilities um, doing a fuzzing campaign. Um, yeah, here's a small di diagram from his. Uh, Looking from his paper, so that you can see um, the good Turing estimator really gives a good estimation uh, in comparison to an empirical um, estimation here. So um, yeah, you can use this in order to have a clue about if you should continue the fuzzing campaign, or if it yeah if it don't make that much sense because fuzzing is also um, really resource intensive, time consuming. And as in a certain point of in time, you really need to decide if you like to continue or if you like to stop because there's no um, hard stopping condition. Um, yeah, and we also use this uh, estimator for the um, verification of static analysis findings. So um, for this findings, we cannot cl classify as true or false positive. And yeah, 
So basically what we did, we executed the test case um, as described previously. Um, then we identified the passes that were executed. Um, yeah, um, estimate the residual risk and then we continue this loop. And in best cases, we in one point in time, we really trigger this vulnerability, then we can or to classify this as a true positive. But when we uh, did not trigger this one, then we will have a residual risk so that we can say, OK, this vulnerability is um, with a residual risk of this and that percent um, is a true positive or not. And this uh, then brings us to the point that we can, yeah, still classify true and false positive, but we can also give a residual risk for the findings so that we can classify them in findings that have a low residual risk, medium or higher one, and depends on how you'd like to classify it. And so you can give the developer a hint to which findings he should analyze um, by himself or debug or check um, if they really can be um, triggered or not. Uh, yeah, so um, to conclude my presentation, I will just present you the research question that we ask ourselves um, in different projects and also when we are writing this book chapter. So we ask ourselves which information can be static analyzers provided to dynamic analyzers that facilitates this analysis um, as I this um, as I presented um, at the beginning, so some test input can be provided, but there for sure can be also more information uh, given to the dynamic analysis in order to improve specifically fuzzing itself because we um, yeah, have this, um, let's say the fuzzing glasses, we're looking everything um, from a fuzzing point of view, um, but for sure it can also be used in other um, dynamic testing techniques. Um, yeah, the second one was um, if the interactive approach is more efficient than dynamic uh, um, analyzers itself and under which conditions. So um, for sure we have more overhead because we need to run a static analysis, which is also not, um, yeah, which is also resource and time consuming. Um, yeah, if you ever had a static analysis, you you know that it's not that fast, depending for sure on, on, the, um, on your system or on the um, source code that should be analyzed. But yeah, you have this additional overhead and there it's reasonable to ask uh, if it's more efficient or if you're just running only the fuzzing campaign and have uh, a certain, uh, uh, the same um, amount of findings, for example. Um, then the, the next research question was, uh, which extents can false and true positive um, be analyzed automatically and discriminate by dynamic analysis? As I presented you, um, we use this estimator for as one example um, in order to um, uh, discriminate the true and post, uh, false positives. Um, and yeah, the last one was is closely related to the previous one. Um, how well do methods used in dynamic analysis to quantify uncertainties and to discover new bugs? So this is this um, good Turing estimator that I already presented to you. And yeah, you can find maybe not all of the, and uh, maybe not all answers, but some of the answers in our book chapter. And yeah, now I'm really looking forward um, to answer your questions. And if you're interested to go more deeper in the technical and theoretical stuff, then please check out our book chapter. Very nice um, part on this uncertainty and can be combining uh, static and dynamic uh, methods. Uh, we have time for one question. Uh, so Anna, do you have a question? <laughs> yeah, so other doesn't have questions, but um, uh, maybe I will um, um, ask a question. Um, so in, in this interactive um, testing, uh, uh, so uh, do I get right the idea that um, static methods helps to reduce number of test cases that you need to run? So you, uh, you identify the execution passes that are more, most kind of relevant actually for testing. Is it is it right? Yes, yeah. It, it's right. It depends on how you define the, the reduce the number of uh, test case because when you have a high number of findings, then for sure you have also to execute a high number of, of uh, test cases. But yeah, in, in theory, yes, if the analysis is really precisely, then you just have to execute this test cases. Um, yeah. Okay. 